at certain times. And that's how uh, some uh, the woman at committing adultery in John got into other Gospels because of the, the way the lectionary was, was produced in the ancient church. But that's just a side point. The point I'm trying to get at is if you look at textual criticism from the history of West, 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 West Cotton Hall and you look at textual criticism from that lens which James White and Jay Smith look at it was a, a secular mindset which was behind their thinking. If you look at it from a different mindset that the, there is what is called the doctrine of preservation we will look at textual criticism in a different way and so in the time of Westcott and Hort you had debates between Westcott and Hort, Scrivener and Dean Bergen Dean Bergen produced vast scholarship to refute Westcott and Hort but his ideas were rejected Scrivener's ideas were rejected I've gone into this historical history in detail so you need to go back everybody needs to go back and listen to my two videos concerning uh, James White and Jay Smith so that's all I want to say at the moment is we can go into the details in manuscripts and text but I think it would be better when you're debating Muslims when you're debating uh, people like Bart Ehrman to say when they say the woman in adultery should not be in the Bible and you have your Bible here and you and it's in your Bible but you say oh it's, it don't matter it doesn't matter it doesn't affect the message that's not going to cut any weight with the Muslim the Muslim is just not going to accept that you, you have lost the debate. It's the same with your ordinary Joe, pers Joe Bloggs on the, on the street, your ordinary person. They're not going to accept it because they can see that the text has been corrupted if you're saying that. A text, a story of the woman committing adultery has got into the text. And you're saying, all right, it shouldn't be there, but it's in there. But it doesn't matter, it doesn't affect the message. But what you're saying is it's been corrupted. And if it's been corrupted there, it could be corrupted in, in other places. Because your root and ground is, it's the message that's important, not the words. But flip it on the other side and look at it from my perspective. If you say, number one, God's words inspired, the words are important. Number two, that we have a doctrine of preservation that God will protect his words. And we go back in history and we can see that the Sinaiticus and Vaticanus come from the Alexandria school that were not very good at copying. They were not accurate in the copying. But if you go to the Antioch school, they were accurate in the copying. And the woman who committed adultery and the passage about the Trinity in 1 John and the last ending of Mark there are uh, manuscripts and manuscript tradition some of them might be later but there are manuscript tradition there are and there is also other lines of evidences that show that the last ending of Mark the woman who committed adultery and the Trinity passage is in the Bible so I can say that this is the word of God, it is in the Bible. I'm able to defend better because I have a strong doctrine of the definition of scripture. I have a strong doctrine of uh, the preservation of scripture. And I can provide you with a textual criticism that can, that can defend that. It's much more stronger, much more robust than being in a debate like James White and Jay Smith who are in the debate and Adam will say to Jay Smith or, or to uh, James White 
you your Bible's been corrupted because you've got passages in there that shouldn't be in there. You've got the woman who's committed adultery. You've got the last ending of Mark. You've got that Trinity passage in your Bible. It shouldn't be there. And then you turn around and say, well, it doesn't matter. It's just the message important. It does matter. You've just admitted the Bible's been corrupted. Things have got into it that shouldn't be there. Whereas my position is, no, there are, it, sh it should be there because, number one, God promises, God defines his, that his words are important. Number two, that his words will be preserved. And number three, we have the textual criticism to prove it. And if you don't know the history of textual criticism, arguments that you've made like, oh, well, the, you know, the last, uh, the, the Trinity passage in, um, the Trinity passage that you said, uh, it, it's a nonsense that we have manuscripts right to the 15th century of it in, but then we, we don't have early manuscripts and, and so therefore you like, right, right, it's done and dusted, that's over with, end of story. But there is a lot of evidence to show that the last, the, the passage of, the Trinity passage in, in 1 John is, is, is in scripture. There is a lot of evidence to show that it, there is. So you can't just dismiss it just because you say there are many, the late, it's not, we, 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 the, the manuscripts are 15th century. <coughs> the same with the woman committing adultery and the same with the last ending of Mark. Because you're coming at it from a completely different method of textual criticism. Which have imbibed which secular, which Christian theologians like James White and J. Smith have imbibed without thinking theologically. Without thinking theologically. <coughs> uh, I've done videos on those three texts, and you can go look at some of the evidence for these three texts to be in the Bible. Um, but that's not the main issue. The main issue is the doctrine of preservation, that God has preserved his word, which we've seen. And so therefore, there is a textual criticism that we can go to that shows that our, the word of God has been preserved. And that is in the, the received text, the Textus Receptus, the Byzantine text that Erasmus used come from a better pedigree, a better purity in the preservation of scripture than the Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, though they be later, they are not the best manuscripts to be doing your textual criticism on. And you would only get this understanding if you had a doctrine of preservation and, and then you were looking for where the words have been accurately preserved. But if you're looking at it from a secular mindset, you, you'll have certain principles of uh, looking at text and certain theories of uh, textual criticism and then you'll go to, to, to history and you'll muddy the waters with your textual theories. So those are my thoughts. I've, I've finished. Uh, I don't want to go on anymore. Uh, so we've looked at the nature of scripture, it's not community, it's defined by scripture. We've looked at the formation of scripture, it was not formed by community. It was formed on the basis of the idea of covenant and text were part of the ratification of the covenant. And then we've looked at uh, textual criticism and the issue that I have with James White and Jay Smith and the issue that I have with you Bob and the, the teams down there that are doing apologetics is you're not aware of the history of textual criticism and the wedge between those who believe in the doctrine of preservation and those who have gone down the West Cotton Hort route and, on, and if you don't understand that you're going to weaken yourself in debate with Muslims. 
you're going to weaken yourself. I am stronger in my debate with Muslims on this issue because I can say what's in the Bible is the very word of God. What's in my King James is the very word of God. Because I have a better textual basis for that in textual criticism. And, and my theological basis is God preserves his word. And if he preserves his word, there will be a textual criticism that will help me to, to defend that. And so we, we have that textual criticism that can be traced back to people like Dean Bergen. Dean Bergen was never refuted in his scholarship concerning uh, the textual criticism that he produced at that time, which defended the King James Bible, which defended the King James text. It was never, he was never refuted. And we need to get back to a doctrine of preservation, we need to get back to an earlier textual criticism. And, and, re, and, and, and the academy needs to be challenged to be more theological and, you, and, and have a doctrine of preservation in its, in its, the academy, the theologians in the academy need to be challenged to have a doctrine of preservation when they look at textual criticism. Rather than taking on textual critical theories, they need to approach it from a theological position. Then go and do the historical inquiry. Those are my thoughts. I'm going to close in prayer. So, so I would encourage you to go and read Dean Bergen's Last Ending of Mark to just show you a different kind of textual criticism, a different way of thinking than a lot of the modern textual criticism today. And I would encourage you to go and read about the history of textual criticism in the time of Westcott and Hall. And uh, I give you a couple of videos with uh, references and notes underneath. I give you a, a list of detailed uh, articles to go and read. And I would encourage you to go and read those articles and study those articles. And they'll equip you to have a better history of textual criticism. So the shot, the 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 the, the top and bottom of this is is that it'll make you more effective for James White and for Jay Smith. That will make them more effective in their apologetics and defending the Bible in terms of the textual criticism and for you as well and for those down there. So I hope the resources that I've recommended to you, I hope the discussion that we've that I've given you today, I hope it just helps you to um, think about these things. Um, if I'm wrong, I'll accept I'm wrong. I don't think I'm wrong. I think what I'm offering you is biblical, solid and helpful. And it's up to you now, guys, in, in, in Hyde Park, to go away and to study what I've presented to you. Uh, go and read on textual criticism, Dean Bergen's paper on the last ending of Mark. And go and research the controversy between Dean Bergen and Westcott and Hort. And then you'll have a grasp of what I'm trying to say on the textual critical issue. Okay? Um... On the issue of formation of canon, read Kruger. And on the issue of the definition of scripture, read Raymond, Westminster Confession, and particularly also uh, Ray Bottomer. I encourage the apologist at High Park to read these books, and I, I guarantee you'll be strengthened in your faith. And I want to thank Bob for the wonderful inspiration he is to everybody. He's a, you're a massive inspiration to us, a massive encouragement, and, and God's mightily using you, bro. So praise God for you. Praise God for Daniel, Godwin, and Lizzie, and Atum, and many others. Praise God for you all, because you're doing a great job. I praise God for Jay Smith. Praise God for um, uh, James White. Um, so I, I've done this video, these videos in a spirit of grace and love 
and uh, I'm sorry for going on and on and on and on going on and on and I'm, I'm even getting fed up of listening to myself but um, I hope I've just given you a few pointers anyway to think in a different way uh, you can also go to go and look at the history of Charles Spurgeon uh, and the downgrade controversy go and investigate that uh, and see how where why the Bible League Quarterly was set up and you'll get a lot of information about the downgrade controversy and about um, about the need to to have a right understanding of scripture okay Th this is a, a Charles Spurgeon on on ministry it's really good but there's the guy Spurgeon go and have a look at Spurgeon and uh, the Sword and Trial magazine about the issues of the downgrade controversy so I'm going to close in prayer uh, thank you for listening and also uh, check out Carl Bart, go and read Carl Bart uh, about neo-orthodoxy and Van Til Cornelius Van Til wrote a book uh, on Karl Barth and you can also listen to lectures by Francis Schaeffer on Karl Barth and also you can listen to I've done a lecture on Karl Barth you can listen to a lecture that I've done and also uh, sorry not a lecture a talk that I did and uh, you can also listen to uh, lectures on Karl Barth by Cornelius Van Til um, if you wanted to study that topic in more detail so I'm going to close in prayer and um, I hope what I've shared uh, edifies and uh, again I want to thank Bob for the great encouragement and inspiration he is to me and to everybody at Hyde Park you, you, uh, God is mightily using you and you, you have uh, amazing gifts, analytical gifts and uh, amazing knowledge and uh, you have been an inspiration to everybody. And, you know, we just pray that God will bless you in your ministry. And uh, your influence will grow. And many people get converted through your work. And the same with many at the Hyde Park. And many of many uh, uh, people like Jay Smith and James White, uh, God is using mightily. So, you know, God bless every, every one of you. But I do think these issues are very serious. Because... Um, History has a habit of repeating itself. And these definitions that you've stated, and also the way James White and Jay Smith approach this apologetic way of saying it doesn't matter about these variants, textual variants, like the woman committing adultery. Um, it, it does undermine the defence of Scripture, and it does undermine... Uh, our apologetic stance and we can be a bit more robust uh, in our in our defense if we if we have a strong theological grounding um, in these areas so I don't pretend to have given the full a full um, explanation and defense of what I'm saying but I just hope that you take some of what I've said and run with it and grow yourself and you'll be even better than you are and you'll be even you know you'll be teaching me on on some of these things all right so god bless you thank you for listening i know it's been two long videos but um i hope it's been a blessing i'm going to pray father we thank you for this day Father, I know that this vi the videos, are, especially the last one, are a little bit long-winded, Lord, but um, it comes from a good heart, a heart to stand for your word and truth and to help our brothers and sisters defend your faith, defend the faith. And I thank you for this day and I thank you for your love. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your mercy. 
And I just pray, Lord, that you bless these videos. I pray you bless our brothers and sisters at Hyde Park. Lord, they're just amazing people, and we just pray that you bless them. Use them mightily for your glory, and just bless them wonderfully, Lord. And I just pray that you bless us all, Lord, that we would work together, learn from each other, grow together, study together, work together, defend the faith together. And uh, we just pray for the Muslims, Lord, that they come to know you as Lord and Saviour. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you. It's been two long videos. Forgive me. I've got to get on. God bless you. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, I hope uh, something might say might inspire you, encourage you. Alright. God bless you. And I hope it's been a blessing. God bless.